in the darkest worlds that ever were. The only thing that brings light are stories. Those stories are kept in one place. The tiny bookcase. <laughs> Welcome, Story Seekers, to the Tiny Bookcase. I'm Ben. I'm Nico, and there's stories are plenty on the way. For this episode, we're joined by an award-winning fantasy author who can always be found with one book or another in his pocket. His critically acclaimed Tide Child trilogy consists of The Bone Ships, Call of the Bone Ships, and, coming in September this year, The Bone Ships Wake. We would like to welcome RJ Barker. Hello, RJ. Hello. I'm really, really pleased to be here. It's good because I get to pretend now that I've just met you at this second and we haven't really been talking for <laughs> yeah, half an hour. into existence just now. Yeah. Who are you people? to the man behind the curtain. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Um, how has uh, the, the general state of the world been impacting you? Is it, have you had any positives, any, any rays of sunshine in the darkness that currently swirls around us? Well, I... My my greatest talent is that I can completely ignore the world. Oh, cool! Um, That's, good. That's good time. And and seeing as I, I basically sat at home on my couch imagining things all the time anyway. That's what I've done for the last ten years. Um, it's not actually changed that much, apart from the fact my wife's at home, which is a a bit stemming because she wants me to do stuff like clean up <laughs> and Hoover. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm working, and she says, "No, no, you're not. You're playing on the PlayStation." It's research. <laughs> it's research. She's she's not doing research. Yeah, but I'm I'm actually I'm sat at her desk to do this because I'm usually I just sit in a different room, oh. and um we have very different working practices. In that her, her desk is just, let's say it's busy, usable, usable. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure it is usable. It's very busy. <laughs> oh right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's lots going on here. Where where my my sort of work area is empty. Uh, I was just going to uh, going to ask what researches you've completed recently. What have you been researching? I, I, oh, Reese, I don't really do Reese. Well, I'm in video uh, games. I'm only making oh, 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 <laughs> oh, oh, the, the, you what games yeah. you've been playing. <laughs> um, I've been playing. Is it called End of Days, where you're a biker and there's lots of zombies? Oh, yes, I think it is called End of. It's yeah, like long I've been playing true. that. It's a, a lot better than the reviews would have you believe. I really enjoyed it. And then I started playing Borderlands Three. Ooh, and I've just downloaded um, Sleeping Dogs, which is kind of triad simulator. Yeah, if, yeah, I've heard about that one. Yeah, because it's it's some um, three pounds fifty. Probably not by the time you hear this yeah, podcast, probably, yeah. but it's three pounds fifty on PlayStation Store at the moment. It's reduced, so I thought I'll check that out. <laughs> but um, I very rarely finish anything now. I sort of start things and get bored. Games have got too long for me. I rather unfortunately recently bounced off. Um, Hideo Kojima's latest effort, um, oh, Death effort. Stranding. Death Stranding. Yeah. It's rather unfortunate because yeah. it's. I was really enjoying it, and for some reason, I just stopped playing it. I couldn't get back into it. I found, uh, as I've got a bit older, that I really enjoy drop in, drop out games. So we play a lot of Sea of Thieves, don't we? Mm, because yeah. you can just start playing it for a bit and then bugger off, and you don't feel when you come back like you've lost the thread and you have to start over. And but I just long form games. I just don't finish them anymore. Now, I've got um. Elite Dangerous on my PlayStation because um, I, I, I'm old enough that I played the original Elite when it first came out on the Commodore 64 um, nice. and it ruled my life. <laughs> <laughs> and it, Elite Dangerous is so well named because it's one of those things that it's just like being in Star Wars, but the graphics are so good and it's just like having your own spaceship. And I've had to stop, I've had to sort of remove oh, it. Are we expecting a, uh, a sci fi from you then in the future? But- that mm, that's what I started off with. Am I um? We this we're already getting derailed, but this this is this is how it works. Um, my first novel that I wrote that was of a saleable stand and that got me an agent was a science fiction novel. Um, and, and it went around all the publishers, but it didn't quite sell. They're all very complimentary, but it it didn't wasn't quite commercial enough. And then um, I parted ways with the agent who sold that because I was doing a fantasy book and he wanted me to do more science fiction. But I'm very, I've had this idea, I'm doing this idea, and I got my new agent, and we sold a fantasy book, and now I'm a fantasy writer, because that's how it works <laughs> <laughs> in the publishing industry. Although, I do have an evil twin, RJ Dark, who's a crime writer, 
Um, <laughs> so, so that there is there is that. Basically, I'm a word tar. I'll, I'll write. I, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's the act of writing that I like. What I'm writing doesn't really matter that much to me. I could I'd do anything. I don't. I think genre is clothes for stories. Oh. Does your depravity know no bounds? <laughs> no. <laughs> right, so uh, I think story time. Um, <laughs> there you are. Before, before Nico takes that one too far. Um, <laughs> He's already offered to put me in a sandwich with Ben. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but you can't sue us. Uh, uh, right, Nick, you're going to be going first, and the prompt this week, which is derived from our guest's story, is Yorkshire. Yorkshire. The opulence of this place is disgusting. If I'm honest with myself, none of it sits well. The bowing and scraping for some ponts who happen to be born in the right castle makes my blood boil. But I'm not here for some swine-faced lord. I'm here for the people he protects. Or that his guards protect by any rate. I imagine the Lord's too busy counting their hard-earned guineas. Taxes for the land. These people work the land. The money should be theirs. I know. I've got to calm down. If I'm angry, there's no chance they'll listen to me. And what I've got to say is nigh on unbelievable. There are voices on the other side of the door at the far end of the hall they've stuck me in. Not so much as a tankard of ale to quench my throat, dry from days of sprinting through woodland. Nothing but a scrap of paper they tell me will get my sword back when I leave. The cold comfort of the dagger on my ankle keeps my fight or flight from kicking in. It keeps me focused. I have a warning to deliver. The doors swing wide and a man every inch of the porcine blob I'd imagined waddles in. The fur on his shoulders is sleek and glossy, none of the matting or stink of my own. His clothes are rich, the dyes in them bright. I fucking hate him. The look on his face tells me the feeling's mutual. Outlaws, they call us, which I suppose is true from their perspective. We do live outside their laws, but it doesn't make us bad men. He seems to be taking me in. His nose crunches into a tight bulb, and I wonder if he can actually smell me from there. I must reek. My hair is plastered to my head by days of sweat and rain. Don't imagine my face looks a comfort either. I'm everything that bastard wants me to be. His Lordship Samuel Clifford! The guard barks the name like a good doggy. This Samuel smiles and takes his plump, cushioned seat. He spreads into it like a toad on a wide rock. Just as slimy and not as good for the world. He proffers a hand. A large red stone glints in the candlelight. His eyes meet mine expectantly. I don't move an inch. I'm not one of his subjects. I won't be puckering my lips so he can present his bare arse for him. His face, it bears none of the hallmarks of a survivor. No rings hang beneath his eyes. The shadows in mine mirror the hollows in the trees I sleep in. The eyes looking out from them are as fierce as anything you'd find in the King's Forest. His flushed cheeks twitch and I can feel the frustration behind him. Do it. Call your pups on me. I'll gut you, you great even twat. I can't. I know. I have to let him break first. He does. I know he would. You interrupt an important meeting. He leans to an advisor, some thin bearded man milky around his eyes. There's a head shake. 
I haven't given a name and it backfoots him. Kestrel, sir. My name is Kestrel. He raises an eyebrow. Kestrel? I have a dozen of those in my aviary. However did you get out? He finars his way through a fat choke guffaw. The advisor at his hip and the guards laugh at his dogshite joke. I stand firm but my teeth creak in my mouth from the pressure I put through them. Well, Kestrel, you interrupt my day. This had best be important. I know there's only earnest passion in my face, but the words struggle to come up. They bubble like fen mud, those long, quivering bubbles that seem like they'll never burst. I breathe slowly. I need to speak. I bring a warning for your land. My people have been camped on the borders of York for some time, and having our way acted as guardians of this land. He looks appalled, like knowing we were on his land brings a sickness to him. Three nights hence we were attacked, on the road from Tadcaster. Two dozen of us were slaughtered. The guards around him shift nervously. The loss of life doesn't faze the Lord. Why would it? I bolted, made haste here. Whatever it was, whatever they were, they can't be more than a day behind me. You need to bring the people into the castle and barricade the door. I need to, do I? His eyes flash. Oh, fuck this, I can tell. He doesn't believe me. He hasn't had the worst of it yet. I will not be told what I need to do by some vagabond in filthy breeches. Whatever they were. His advisor's voice cuts across him. He's read as rhubarb now, but the blind man's voice carries clear. They say that blind men sense better without their eyes in a way. Perhaps he can feel the truth in my words. It's as I say, I cannot tell you what those things were. Cannot? Or will not? He's clearly intelligent, but I mean what I say. I cannot, Councilman, for I do not truly know what they were. Shadows. Shadows that could raise a man from the ground and break his back as though it were kindling. Shadows that can make a man's blood pour out of his mouth like wine from a jug. I shake my head. I don't have the words to accurately describe what I saw. I'm not learned. I only know the simplest of truths. This is too big for a man like me. All I know is what I felt, what, what I saw. I saw men I loved burst like apples full of worms. I saw the campfire dance like a knife fighter. I saw throats split and heads smashed and nothing there to do it. Save the wind and the shadows. The Lord breaks his frustrated silence. Each word spat like venom. This man is clearly a deceiver. He speaks of devils and debauchery. This is some ploy, some trick against my lands. He fixes me with an evil glare. He wants me to shrink. He wants me to beg him. I fucking won't. He's an idiot. Why would I run into danger unless to escape a greater threat? The man is no survivor. The man is just waiting to die. My liege. No, Aethel. I will not be deceived by some forest wretch. Guards, arrest him. I can't help it then. My fury bubbles over and I grab the knife from my boot. And with the Lord in a few swift bounds, the last drops of strength flowing out of me to make this dash, and then I'll be spent. And it isn't enough. It never could have been, but I'd do it anyway. I'd shove that dagger into the fat fool's chest. Too high. Curse myself. 
He shrieks in rage and horror as blood stains his finery. But he won't die. I missed his heart. I begin to drift to sleep as the guards strike me for the first time. I hit the ground at speed, and that bleeding, heaving monster stands over me. But I'm not afraid of him. Not compared to what I know is coming. Those poor people out there will be dead in a day, swallowed up by the impending darkness. And this idiot could have saved them all. I should have kept that dagger in my boot. When they threw me to a cell, I could have gored my own stomach or opened my throat. Would have been better to die that way. Now I just have to wait. Very nice. I am sold. Are you Sean Bean? <laughs> Busted. <laughs> Busted. <laughs> You neither confirm nor deny that I am in fact Sean Bean. <laughs> well, if he lives to the end of the podcast, we know he's not. So. <laughs> um, I th- that was great. Um, it's a really weird thing that I discovered doing going and doing stuff that lots of people can read. Not as many people can read really well. And that, that was really good. Um, that That's was extremely really- kind of you. <laughs> It's a, uh, I'm, I'm so Benny. He has set set the bar high for for me and you. <laughs> Does it every week. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's very good, but yeah. I also thought the quality of the prose was really high. Like mm. there were so many nice turns of phrase. The um the idea of this like large like you described him porcine blob mm. being like a toad spreading out on a wide rock. Yeah, I thought that really characterised him immediately. Um. I mean, the Alan Bennett voice helped. <laughs> but I can neither confirm nor deny that I am, in fact, Alan Bennett. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I picked out the toad on, on a wide rock. Um, yeah. I'd be tempted to lose wide from that phrase. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I think I, I kind of, if I close my eyes and think of a toad, it's quite, you know, lumpy and large. So, so I don't think you need white. I think it's kind of implied within Toad. Um, but that that's that's me. Um, I'm very much into removing words. Yeah. I, I, think, I think you might well be right there. I think. Yeah, I, th- I think it's a skill I don't really have, the, yeah. that kind of trimming. So it's a, it's a nice thing to have. Because I'm telling you that, <laughs> yeah, Toad on a rock is, is going in something I write. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Lift is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, earlier on, you, you talked about days of sprinting through the woodland. Um, yes. Uh, I don't think that's physically possible to sprint constantly. Yeah. Uh, I, I would I, I would roll that back a little bit. Hustling, um, maybe. Like the idea of like hustling along. Yeah. Even running would be enough. I think sprinting yeah. it implies a, a very sort of focused, short burst of speed. It'd be darting or something. I oh, know that's also just too. Yeah. It quick, it's, isn't it? It's or struggling, quick. even. Yeah, struggling. It, it felt like struggling. Your story. It felt like he was knackered. Like he, he trudging. Was... Maybe trudging is the word. Trudging is an excellent Yorkshire I mean, word. With, with trudging, though, you lose the the fact that he he feels like they're on his heels, doesn't he? Because yeah, uh-huh. he says he says that it, in a day they'll all be dead. So mm. he must know that they're immediately behind him, pretty much. So he, so I think trudging. Isn't you, quite as fast as you need it to be, but something like if you, run, running or something would work. Being chased is the because I I didn't oh, quite yeah. get from it that they were directly behind him, um, uh, and I think if you put being chased, it would add a bit of urgency. Yeah. Oh, okay. Anyone with a thesaurus, feel free to tweet at us. With <laughs> yeah. Words that we've all failed to yeah. come up with. But I think that like we're getting there with like the, the idea that you're going for narratively, and it, and it's a it's yeah. a lovely bit of description. Especially this idea, like, so I, I wrote down a couple more ones, which were um, that the uh, the shadows under your main character's eyes mirror the hollows mm. of the trees that he sleeps in. Yeah. Um, I, I really enjoyed that as a bit of characterization, and the uh, gourd his own stomach got me mm. as well, because there's there's something like digging about a goring, isn't there? Yeah. Like, rather than just stabbing or slashing, 
the idea of, yeah the idea of digging around inside your own belly with a knife is horrid it's trying to get a lot of animal in, imagery in this mm. one and i think that that definitely came from that the idea of you know this woodsman would see it as what a boar does to a man rather than mm. what a man does to a man yeah on yeah. on um character there was there was a line about him saying doesn't make us bad men uh, and i thought that felt too self-aware for somebody of this sort of period yeah um and and possibly too simple given the language you've used because it is it, he's yeah. very in character and and i thought maybe with his resentment you, you might be going for something like the fact that that bloke put them there that that being who he is is no choice of his um yeah the people that defined where the where the law is uh, yeah chosen that for yeah i like yeah. yeah i can see that yeah but i thought that that actual it's really bad when you kind of go into the, the minutiae of something because you, you, I, I loved it. I really enjoyed it. I, I really liked it. I, I um, never see it as a negative thing because if you yeah, know it's... into the minutiae of something, that's because it's worth doing. If you take uh, yeah. time to pair a rose bush, it's because you yeah. you know that it's going to grow it is... into roses again. Yeah. Is is he called Kestrel? Is that a nod to a Kestrel for a nerve? Um, it wasn't. Film? Or, or Kez, the film? It was not announced to the film Kez. I yeah. wish it was. That no, nice. where you, that's the rule of writers. If somebody says something, you think, oh, I wish it was. You go, yeah. Yeah. You just oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> it was both. Yeah. It was a, both. The Kez was a reference to Kez, to the film Kez, and the troll was a <laughs> reference to <laughs> Kez. <laughs> yeah. I, I love the line about blind men feel the truth. Mm. I, I, I thought that was lovely. Yeah. Um, and it, yeah. sorry, I was just going to say the, the story structure wise, um, I, I enjoyed it. It reminded me very strongly of the opening of Game of Thrones. Um, mm. Oh yeah, I can see that. With this idea of, I think I think the character is uh, Waymar Royce that fights these like others in the um, in the forest, uh, and then I think one one of one of his cr crew escapes, gets to Winterfell and is is executed for being a deserter from the wall. Yeah. Um, and he tries to do the warning thing, but obviously in that scenario, it's this, you know, he's he's transgressed in another way, so he's going to be executed anyway. Like this was very much more like this man has kept his head to a certain degree, wants to warn people, has nearly run himself to death to do it. So there were differences, but I, but I liked it because it it felt like the start of something much bigger in the way that that does for that massive mm -hmm. book series, um, and that you that you did it in the real world as well. That it was Yorkshire. Yeah. yeah, I liked that. I, yeah. I like. I thought it was going to be Vikings, actually. Ah, yeah, Vikings. I, I, I thought it even nearly Vikings. was. Yeah, it nearly was. And then you went monsters, which monsters. is, is all, monsters are always better. Monsters are always better. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I like the phrase "not learned" as well. I'm not a learned man. I, I thought that was that was really lovely bit of characterization and self awareness of him that felt right for that person. Yeah. Um, and and then, um, because because there's always there's always sugar and 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 spice. Um, he says, "Fucking wasn't." And for some reason, that little bit of swearing, I, I didn't think that should be there. I don't know why. Mm. <laughs> it's one of those weird things where you just where you ever just hear something and think, "I oh, not at that point." Yeah, and and I can't. And I, that in the end comes down to. Just personal taste. Uh, is it is it possibly that he's that he's so weary that he's he's nearly falling over, and like swearing like that is is quite exuberant, isn't it? it, it yeah, almost, almost takes up quite a lot of energy to to swear yeah. even even inside your own mind or whatever. It, to get yourself worked up like that spends energy that he doesn't. Perhaps the character doesn't have in that scene. It it uh, could be that. Uh, um, we also we just in that that bit we had to arrest him. Where, where I felt he was kind of already arrested. He'd been locked up at the beginning of it and brought out. Oh, I think I missed that one. Uh, um, maybe take him, might be. Yes, yes, that is a much better line, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's all really ultra nitpicky. And then um, he used Drift Off to Sleep, which I thought was far too soft for that moment when it, I suspect he would be having the absolute shit kicked out of him. See, that one was on purpose. Uh -uh. As if... 
he he allows himself to begin falling asleep before they even start hitting him. Maybe unconsciousness. Yes, it's unconsciousness. Yeah, yeah. Because I think uh, sleep is ca- it's very gentle. Uh, <laughs> but the, these these are ultra nitpicky things. Yeah. You know? I, I, I thought it was lovely. As a um, scene, it was very powerful. Yeah, and and, and very well realized. Like I felt like I was there. You you. The way that you described the characters and performed the characters really brought it all crashing to life. I felt um, I, I, I had a good time there, man. I think you did a, did a good one. The, the last thing that I thought, and I'm re- I'm really bad at criticism because usually what I do is I rewrite things to be what I would do rather than. Yeah. I, I always talk about this that editors are a magical, strange beings because they they take your work and they make it more you. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I am not an editor. I, I, I'm a writer, so I want everything to be what I would do. Um, so I will ruin other people's stuff if they give it to me. <laughs> but um, I did think you could end it a little bit sooner with him killed and just thinking that that is a blessing to what is coming for these people because they've not listened. Do you know, when I was reading it out, I thought that. Uh, I thought it should have ended at uh, I'm not afraid of him, not compared to what I know is coming. Yeah, that's what I've written. Not what is coming. Yeah. That's the line oh. I'd put as, put as the end. I th- and I as I read it, I thought, do I bottle it and stop? But I thought, no, I've written another bit, so we'll, we'll read it as I as I wrote it. But I had exactly the same thought on that read-through. Yeah, I, I don't think you need it. I, th- I think that's a good one. But, but if you like it, do it. If it makes you happy. Because it wasn't wrong in any way who knows what's wrong nobody knows it's art isn't it i I think this is this has been fascinating like this has been uh the closest to actual like workshopping that we've done in a while i think (laughs) Um, it's it's, it's really good fun like i'm hoping that people listening are interested as well to see us all like pull it you know pull it apart like look at how sentences could be structured better for narrative and Hmm. or just descriptive uh, terms i i because i i love doing this like uh, like sat on my own editing my own work you know this idea of like making yourself sound more like yourself or, or having an editor do it for you it's it's a cool process yeah, yeah. and, and it's, it's really weird as well because I, I i'm i have no technical ability if my my agent once sent me a, an email and said could you remove half the adjectives from this rj and i had to go and google adjectives I, <laughs> <laughs> it's all done by feel but it and rhythm and i can close my eyes and and I feel sentences in my head and I speak them out loud and that's how I do my work. So I, I love this oh, process wow. of listening to somebody. somebody. It's because I didn't bother going to school because I was going to be a rock star. <laughs> we'll come back to that. Oh, yeah, we're definitely yeah. coming back to that. Yeah, but don't ow, do it, kids. Um... <laughs> <laughs> um, Ajit, my, my understanding is that you're going to be uh, reading something that didn't see much love the first time it came out? Yeah, it's, it's about 10 years old. Right. And... In a way, it's the start of my publishing journey because it, oh. it it appeared on my blog, and um, Simon Spanton, who was one of the editors at Galanx, the um, science fiction and fantasy imprint, read it and sent me an email saying that's too good for no one to read. It's a lovely oh. backhanded compliment, um, <laughs> 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 and he put it on the Galanx blog, and because of that, one of their writers wanted to read more from me, and I sent him a much longer story. And he passed it to his agent, and his agent liked it and picked me up from that. So it's kind of oh, what? anyone that tells you publishing is a who you know is rubbish. It is all about what you write, and the editors are out there looking all the time. They're not like sat there in their throne rooms. Oh, that's um, very encouraging. Yeah, waiting for their mates. That's not not <laughs> how it works. <laughs> so, um, and it's called the Shepherd, uh, and I love it. It's something I've done that I really, really like. That that doesn't mean you can't rip it apart. Um, <laughs> I will resent you, but you can still do it. Um, <laughs> oh, double edged. Yeah, it and, and it kind of disobeys your rules because I know you said eight hundred words, and it's not. It's about six hundred. Um, well, that's fine. It's, it's the we, shortest thing I've ever written. Um, and uh, shall I do it? Shall I just go for it? Yeah, go for it. it. We're ready okay, for it. okay. I'm just gonna have a quick drink. Mm. It's not only very short, but I split it into three parts because I'm a right pretentious git. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if you know anything about shepherding, but um, that, that um, I said it 
to a lot of American publishers and they just had no idea what it meant. I've I know read, come by come round. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 that kind of thing, yeah. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll go through it and, and see yeah. if anything is familiar to you. The Shepherd. One. Lift. I used to hear foxes screaming and dream it was people. Now I hear people and wish it was foxes. Only occasionally now, mind. The screams still drift across the heather carpeted moors and into my hayloft prison, carried here on freakish warm winds. The first time I ever heard cries for help, it had me pacing up and down the barn loft, desperate to do something, hobnailed boots drumming out my impotence on the wooden floor. Pacing doesn't feel safe now. This old building creaks like a ship under sail. I have one shotgun cartridge. My world is green and purple, brown and white and red. Yan, Tam and Tetherer rule here. Two, fetch. Yan is eight, pure breed border collie and the best sheepdog I ever had. Tam is ten, Yan's mother and always the calmest of the three. Tetherer is one and a half and only just out of puppyhood. He's rotting away the fastest. I, I don't know why. Tam sits well back, ready to return any of the flock that try and make a break. Tetherer runs tireless circles around the herd, his legs trailing strips of filthy skin and fur. But it's always Yan that drives them forward. He sits, stares up at me from empty eye sockets, does it for hours on end. Then, when he can bear it no more, he hunkers down his forequarters, raises his tailless rump into the air and he starts the drive, frightening the flock, pushing them against the barn. It moans under the stress of so many bodies. Sour rotten, the stink of sheep fills the air. The dogs never kill members of the flock, but they won't let them rest or eat either. A ewe burst from the pressure of a thousand of its fellows once. Spraying red over the dirty white balling mass around it. They never bark, the dogs. I'm so hungry. I used to love lamb. Three. Drive. My, my legs won't work. I, I could bear it no longer. Tried to end it. The shotgun misfired, burning and bruising my face, but doing no else. I fell back from the blast, did something to my neck. Everything hurts now and I can barely move. In last night's rain and wind, something went, something structural in me and in this place. The whole barn healed over by 45 degrees. Cold water poured in through the roof as if I didn't know enough misery. The dogs can almost jump into the hayloft. Every so often, Tetherer makes an attempt to get in and I have to fend scuttering claws away from the hatchway in the floor with the shotgun, but the weapon's useless for anything else. But so am I. Tam sits patiently at the edge of the flock. Her tongue lolls from her mouth, lifeless and dead without her animating pant. And the pressure of the flock forces rhythmic, groaning breaths from the old building's timbers. A splinter as long as my arm vibrates at stomach height. The only sharp thing I can reach. I'm, I'm not scared of dying. Just the pain. Jan hunkers down his forequarters, raises his tailless rump into the air and starts the drive, frightening the flock, pushing them against the healing barn. With a whip crack report, another support gives way and the barn moves another inch lower. Jan's sightless eye sockets stare up at me as a sea of sheep wash up against the building. Waves of panicked flesh and wool. Not long now, lad, I tell him. Not long now. Best sheep dog I ever had. That was stunning, RJ. Fucking hell. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Bloody hell. That was just... Every single sentence was, was rifled to perfect perfection there, it felt like. Um, Thank you. I love it. Yeah. It, it, it. <laughs> so we normally keep notes, uh, both Ben and I, and I'd started writing down the first sentence about the hearing 
foxes scream and imagining it was people. Yeah. And then realized I was just going to transpose your story. Yeah. If I carried on. <laughs> and I didn't want to miss anything. So I just listened. Yeah, I did I did the same thing. I, I started writing exactly the same thing. I started writing down down that down that line, you know, the uh, wishing it was foxes. Mm. And I thought, because I thought that was a banging way to open a story, and then it was just line after line after line of just great stuff, um, with a great cadence to it as well. Like you used numbers amazingly, I thought during that story. It's um, um yeah. it's based around the commands they give sheep. Sheep so, dogs lift, lift, fetch, and drive, and, fetch and drive. Yeah, like yam, tam, and tether are traditional Yorkshire names for sheep dogs. I, um, my understanding is that they yam, tam, tether is um counting. It's counting, isn't it? Yeah, it's what. It's, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, um, I was in Cumbria for a little while when I was yeah. uh, growing up, and I, I kind of picked that up there somewhere. I'm not entirely sure where from. Did you hear people speak in the dialect? It, it's amazing. It's like another language. Um, it it, it got a bit thick sometimes. It had to be said. Um, <laughs> like even you know, even if somebody wasn't speaking like deliberately in a dialect way, like the way they would mm. say something like water, uh, was just phenomenal it just either either with entirely or with like a lip smack in the middle of the word it was it's great stuff um it's it sounds amazing but yeah. uh the, this um the, this so i know you said i, said, I think you said uh you, you were pretentious for doing it one two three at the start but i thought that broke it down wonderfully like you managed to get a real um a real a real structure in so few words yeah um <laughs> Which which gives it a lot of power, I think. Um, I think the reason I like it is it does in in sort of short form what my much longer fantasy trilogies do, in that hopefully it it builds up something, tells you about relationships, and then punches you in the heart. I, I was going to say it's what I really enjoyed about it was that it felt like a a horror story. But the overwhelming emotion was sadness, mm-hmm. and not even in a like a despair way, or a, but just true sadness. But I'm the, a the, absence, yeah, the absence of joy and hope, <laughs> <laughs> and for it to for that to be for it to have those those hallmarks of the supernatural and the horrific, and that to be the driving force behind it, it's just it's actually not something I've experienced before. And it really, really worked for me. Mm. It, it's there's, there's a thing that I, I like to do with stories, which is take a, a seemingly ridiculous idea uh, and then push it. Because I started off with zombie sheepdogs. Um, and the line about foxes was, was um, I live in the middle of Leeds, right on the edge of the town, but we live in an old mansion. That sounds yeah. much grander than it is. We live part of an old mansion. Um, and, and there are foxes outside. And they just sound like people being murdered. <laughs> it, it regularly get up and think, oh my God, someone's been killed. And it's just foxes shagging. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I love that. I've, I've got a friend, Kit Power, who I, I do Rhyopolis with, um, wrote a story about murderous chickens. And <laughs> I, I, I'll send him to you and I'll see if I can get him to read it to you. Because it's genuinely terrifying and it has no right being. <laughs> And I love stuff. Yeah, I'll send send Kit to you, and he's a great reader as well as Kit. Oh, oh lovely! I well, look forward to that. Yeah. The um, the uh, the creaking danger of this of the of the barn going over, um, is is a lovely little framing device as well. Um, mm. yeah, the, the whole thing just I, I'm not sure I'd change a word. Like I know I know this is something that you've you've clearly polished um very successfully, but um I I genuinely love that story. Um, and the whole, the whole way through it carried. Yeah, is it or is it just it, on the Glanks website? It's on the Glanks blog. Mm. Um, if you have a website for your thing, I'll send it to you because it's, mm. it's. I'm quite happy to have it. Whatever. Have it One day, I intend to, hopefully to do a collection of short stories and put it in that. But um, you're, you're quite welcome if you have a website to put it on it because it's short enough to stick up. Places. We'll have to. We'll have to direct people mm. to it for Even sure. If it's just a link. Yeah, I'd, yeah. I'd be honoured to pop that. Mm. And share it with people. It would be wonderful, mm. just really wonderful. Thank you. It, it's because you ne- you never know. It's the weirdest thing about being a writer. You just 
you never know. You sit there and you write things. And it might be brilliant or it might be terrible. And, and the only way of finding out is to give it to other people. And a, that's quite a difficult step, I think, for anyone to... For you to have like, done three seasons of reading your own stories out. And, and you were saying earlier on, I think it was before we were on this, that, that you didn't have much experience of it to start off with. In particular, talking to people about it, yeah, other people. Massive and brilliant thing to do. Mm. I can't wait to hear Ben's. <laughs> oh, no, and I've got to follow both of those. Uh, <laughs> it's the, uh, ramping, man. It's, <laughs> it's ramping. Just, like, just as a follow-up to what you just said, though, although Nico and I have been doing this for um, nearly a year now, I think we're coming up on the day of recording, I think it's about uh, 14 days or something until our anniversary, yeah. um, which sounds a bit weird now I say that out loud, but there we go. Um, <laughs> um I've um I, I wrote a first draft of a of a book last year and mm. I've only recently been able to show Nico the first like the prologue and the first chapter because for whatever reason like we can we can do this together but I I was very nervous about it, and he was the first person that I showed it to mm. so it, it is a it is a massive step and um it does feel like you're holding your breath a little bit when you do it and a, a novel as well is a, a even more of an investment of your time yeah. and energy and, and kind of love I, I think i wrote five before i was good enough before you went there yeah um, yeah i i mean we, we can maybe get into this a bit later when we talk about writing yeah. and stuff but it, uh, yeah it was um it was an interesting process to say the least um right go on ben oh you God. can't stall anymore i uh, know <laughs> he's figured me out <laughs> oh, right okay Yorkshire, 1889. Inspector Harold K. loved a good smoke. He affected that it helped him think by plastering a pondering look on his face when in company. In fact, K. simply used it to empty his mind. All those little shouts and pulls on his attention from his life seemed to quiet when he tamped and sparked his clay pipe. It also masked the smell of blood. They'd found him smoking his pipe the day he'd killed his wife. She'd been as quick and as clever as anyone, but she'd become sloppy in her deceit. When Kay had caught her and her lover, she had known he would likely use his revolver on the pair of them. She'd attacked first by throwing a candlestick at him. Kay had caught the heavy stick and used it to beat them both into a bloody mess. His mind had felt like it was on fire as he dressed his wife's lover to conceal his crime. With the scene prepared how he'd have liked to have found it, he sat back and brought out his pipe. He knew his neighbours hadn't believed it, and even his fellow officers found it unlikely that Kay was lacking in guilt. No one could prove it, but they all knew what had happened. Kay avoided spending his days pacing the yard of York Prison or dancing at the end of a rope. Instead, he'd gone back to work. The constabulary kept Kay busy with the strange and violent crimes that flared continuously across the county. In his jaded state, Kay thought that the stranger the crime was the better. Unlike the famous consulting detective in London, up-jumped addict that he was, Inspector K didn't do his job so it could be written about later. He did it because he was good at it, and he needed to be good at something. When the mass-murdering Blake Baskerton escaped in 82, it was K who had found him, skulking amongst the heather on the moor. He'd cheated the hangman with Blake's own chains that night, and when the man had turned with the moon, K did him in again. Then there was that bitch who drowned children in the marshland near the Humber estuary. She'd survived the lead from his revolver until he dragged her from the water. Kay could not rid himself of the memory of the smell her caustic wounds had emitted when they'd begun to dry and smoke. Others might write off the strangeness of Kay's cases, claiming there are no monstrous black dogs upon the moor, or hags in the mirrors. To Kay's mind, they could say what they wanted, and it wouldn't change a thing for him. He was damn good at finding any kind of criminal, and nothing anyone said or did could change that, until the shambles. Sixteen murders in two weeks. The rags that shouted the news placed the blame firmly at the boots of the constabulary. All of York was afire with fear and excitement as the bodies piled up in the morgue. Each corpse had been exsanguinated from massive neck wounds. The victims were men, women, and in one particularly gruesome case, two children in the same incident. Nothing linked the sixteen beyond that they had been killed in the same fashion. The constabulary, on the advice of the bishop, burned the bodies. Inspector Kay, however, began to establish the pattern. The link, it seemed to him, 
wasn't the victims, but the places at which they'd been killed. After marking up a map of the city, Kay took to the fog-laden streets and went in search of a murderer. His map led him to the abandoned church at the base of the old butcher's street known as the Shambles. Dimly illuminated by the shop lanterns, Kay could see up to where the jetty buildings that housed dozens of butcher shops leaned in closely, as if whispering a secret from gable to gable. The lock on the church gave under his boot, and Kay swept inside. The smell of cold dust swam in his nostrils as the quiet of the holy place stretched the sound of his boots on the stone floor. Anything of value or importance had been moved to the minster three weeks ago after the last priest had moved on, or so the story went. Kay found what he was looking for in the vestry. The heavy slabs that made up the floor of the functional room had been moved aside to reveal the darkness below. He scooped up a half-empty oil lamp from the side table and lit it with a black-headed tiger match. Armed with his lamp, Kay lowered himself into the hole and jumped the last few feet to land with an unpleasantly viscous splash in the sewer. The place reeked, of course, but Kay had smelled worse. He moved through the subterranean ship tube carefully, all of his senses stretching out into the dark. He moved west and then turned north at a split in the sewer. Ahead, cast in the half-obscured nimbus of the shop lanterns, he could see the underside of the dripping drains that serviced the runnels of the shambles. There, butchers cast the unused flesh parts of the animals they segmented on their kiosk shelves. The river of the sewer had been partially dammed by the offal which had fallen, and the flesh that still clung to the drain caused the steady but small waterfall of animal blood to cascade into the faecal water. The man hit him like a cannonball, crashing into his side and bashing Kay's shoulder against the sewer wall. Kay flailed, and his oil lantern was snuffed out by the sloshing tide of excrement. He reached for his revolver, but the man pulled him up and backwards by his chin. Kay's fingers closed around the grip of the revolver on his belt and brought it up as his assailant sank his teeth into his throat. Kay fired before his neck could be torn out and felt the splatter of the man's face meat against his own cheek. The deafening gunshot rang out in the tight sewer and Kay couldn't hear anything for a moment. The man had let him go after the shot and Kay turned one hand on his bleeding neck to search for him. His assailant, a tall, pale, naked man, wallowed in the filth. Half his head had been blown off and he was greedily squeezing blood into his ruined mouth from the shit-soaked discarded offal. Kay watched, his ears ringing from the gunshot, as the man's face slowly began to regrow. The splattered tendons and muscles reformed and pulled taut under fresh skin. The face that looked up at Kay held only madness. Kay put the remaining five bullets into the man, who twitched and vibrated with each impact. Three struck him in the head, obliterating his skull entirely and the remaining pair sank into his chest. The man stopped writhing after a moment, and Kay quickly dragged him upstream of the horrid bloody feast, and sat with the body until his ears stopped ringing. Inspector Harold Kay was commended for his work by the York Constabulary the next day, and by the following year, few in the city remembered or cared about the gruesome fortnight of murders. Of course, murders still occasionally occurred, and when they did, the York Constabulary put their best man on the case. Those officers that watched him work admired Kay for his pensive attitude and hard man demeanour whilst he smoked his clay pipe and studied the murder scenes. Kay, his face set in an aspect of thought, liked the way it matched the smell of the blood on his breath. I'm I'm sold again. I I really enjoyed that. I I like a Sherlockian style thing. That that sort of era, I'm, I'm there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I decided that uh, it was so obvious that I had to ca- have him cast some shade at Sherlock. Yeah. <laughs> I thought there were quite a few really good lines in there that would have made, easily made a first line. Um, uh, the, the one about masking the smell of blood right at the beginning. Mm, um, yeah. You could have started with that. Um, 16 murders in two weeks. That's that's a killer start line uh, as well. Not that what it was, wasn't it? It was just that. I, I like that there's good, really good lines coming through. I was like, oh, brilliant. I'm here. Yeah, that's, that's kind of you, yeah. I, I like the 16 murders in two weeks because it, it it's then part of the, um, mm. uh, you know, the, 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 the tabloid like, rags that he's talking about. Mm. It sounds like one of their headlines, doesn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> the, uh, I wrote down, <laughs> and I'm still trying to work out why, I wrote down subterranean shit tube. <laughs> I also wrote that, but I think I know why you wrote that. And I, <laughs> I, I think that I really liked that line, but it didn't fit the story. 
and I yeah. think you're possibly yeah. guilty of putting it in there because you knew I would like it. <laughs> <laughs> there may have been an element to that. To that. <laughs> See, I think exactly the same as Nico. Yeah. But it started me upon a train of thought. That I, did you write this this week? Uh, yes. Uh, well, yeah, yeah yes. Um, yeah. I saw most of it this week, yeah. Because I think you're you're part way onto something. I, it's it's really good as it is. I think this is on a on a journey to being something that I could hear in the background of it. This might just be me. And that line is why I heard it. Is there's a mixture of real crassness and quite wordy words, mm. and they kind of fight against each other. That's Ben uh, you're describing there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and it did make me wonder if if you could rewrite this as him not being a police officer, because and, and it's it's you know you said you 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 skipped over Inspector Cave and it difficult to say. Mm-hmm. Um, well, it started the thought because I, I'd written just K, just take off Inspector, and then when you got to that line, I just thought, oh God, what if this man is because he is a monster? He, he murders his wife at the beginning. Mm, yes, he does. What if this man is this brutal sort of Mr. Hyde type figure ah. that the police need because he's the only one that can deal with these creatures? He, uh, in that way, I got a real John Constantine vibe from him. Yeah. Oh, in yeah, it. yeah. Okay. So a lot of like, yeah. oh, he's definitely not a good guy, but yeah. he's the best person for that specific awful job. Yeah. <laughs> And, yeah, and, and I, sorry, I, I think that could definitely be um, explored uh, a bit more. I'm, I have, um, I have a rather nasty habit to um, take the piss with the word count for this uh, particular <laughs> endeavor, and so I was, I, I kind of, I kind of had that feeling that n- not exactly as you've said it, because I think that's a really, really clever point. Um, but like, I got the impression that I could expand on this in a different way. Yeah. Given the word, given, given the extra wordage, perhaps. Yeah, I think um, you've definitely got a novella in that. Yeah, I was going to say, it's got bigger story legs in there. Yeah. I, if anything, that there was too much in that for a short story. Um, Do I you think... know how it, it could work? You know GCPD, the comic run? For for the listeners, it's um, Gotham City Police Department. <laughs> and it's a Batman story told from the perspective of the Gotham City Police. <clears throat> and I really enjoy it because... You know, it, it adds that air of mystery to Batman. If you can't see everything he's doing, yeah, it's sort of a greater threat. And uh, I think that story could be really interesting from that perspective, mm. from the you know the Bobbies or whatever the Yorkshire equivalent is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not quite sure actually. It's but it's it, it's Bobbies. Even, not necessarily the for the whole story even, but this, you know, we have to get help from him but you know not shit like that yeah 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 because yeah. okay, okay. yeah. um, you had the word exsanguinate in there and i thought that's too big a word um, too big for him too too big a word for the for the story I, I think it's one of those words that that we like as writers but... oh okay one of the writer words oh yeah, yeah. okay yeah i, I yeah. see it i see it unblooded is the word <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. blood dry i i loved the phrase turned with the moon I put a big A star and a tick next to that word. <laughs> I, I really loved that. Yeah. Um, um, what was the other bit? Um, when he's in the fight with the the vampire. Yes. So, but we we don't say it's a vampire. Um, he started with the man hit him, but he's in a dark sewer. How yes. does he know that? Um. I think it, so. The next bit is that he that he's crashed into his side. So I think he's like yeah. it, like he's attack. He's like charged him rather than it's rather than it being like a punch or a mm. kick or anything like that. But he 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 doesn't know it's a man because he chases monsters. True. Um, so yeah, you're looking for a phrase like the impact. Or yeah. The, yeah, or the thing hit him perhaps. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it hit him. Uh, it hit uh, him. Yeah, yeah. You never have to say it's a man because we we don't know that. And it's also more scary, I think. Yeah, okay. Man. Yeah, if I, if I... yeah, creature. I think, I think right. Yeah, yeah. Mm. The because especially because later on we have the 
when when he actually sees him properly in the, in the half light, mm. it's it's at that point that he sort of yeah sees this man shaped. And and I love that you never say it's a vampire because of course he would not know. No, no, yeah. Because that that's that, that's relatively modern folklore. I um, I like that we just on the Yorkshire element of this, mm. we all ended up on the supernatural in some sense, mm. and all in different time periods. Mm. And it's that, been yeah. here a long time. Yeah, that's, that's just interesting <laughs> yeah. to me that yeah. we all went that same way. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, especially because I, uh, although although you told me a bit about it uh, via email, um, RJ, I actually didn't hmm. didn't say to Nico anything about that. Um, I just said that the prompt was Yorkshire, <laughs> <laughs> cheekily. Um, so yeah, no. Um, I'm I'm enjoying the idea of like. Uh, Going away and taking some of this this feedback and turning it into a novel, not a novel, sorry, a novella. Mm. Um, I think that would I think that would be a lot of fun to do because um, I had a lot of fun fun writing it. I I don't often write any kind of like supernaturally horror mm. uh, kind of thing or detective stuff. So it was for me it was kind of fun to yeah. crash the two together. See, I love a detective story. I I love them. I just mm. I, I I sort of haven't had the courage to try it. Um, because they have to be so tight to make sense, um, and even in this, I felt like I, I sort of skipped over a little bit. Like the the his investigation is kind of quite simplistic in this, mm. um, which I, I don't think I was a hundred percent happy with. But um, I d- I don't think it it kind of needs to be. I, li- I like the way that was done because it's a short story. It, it doesn't need to be intensely complex. Um, but when it's I, a novella, yeah, <laughs> yeah. then it needs we to be expect expensive. more. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I, I, yeah, I, th- I think you should, I, w- I would read the novella of that. I, li- I like that Victorian kind of tone and way of, way of, and I love that image of him sat there tamping his pipe, get rid of the smell of blood because he's just killed his wife and he is a monster. Yes, he's um, he's, and, a, and, and, he's absolutely horrible. Yeah, and, and I like that. I think there's a lot of tension in it that you know, I'd be tempted to put him up against a monster. That's have you ever come across the um, Saint Germain books? By uh, Chelsea Queen Yarbrough. I haven't. I don't know about you, no. Nico. Very few people have. Um, Anne Rice did her thing, and Chelsea Queen Yarbrough was doing vampires. Um, and Saint Germain is a, a a vampire that has lived forever, um, uh, and he's incredibly human and intelligent, and he doesn't kill people. He just needs a bit of blood. Um, mm. And each of these stories are him. He turns up trying to do good, and eventually we work out what he is, and they try and murder him. And he's just like, no, I'm, I'm really trying to help you. And they're just amazing. But I kind of thought, oh, oh yeah, you, you have this monster of a man that hunts monsters. What happens when he, when he hunts something that isn't? Would he recognise that? Yeah, when, when he turns. I, I think, uh, so I was I was very much having an ahhing over whether or not to put in the scene where he kills his wife. Um, hmm. Because, but so the reason that I've left it in, I don't know whether this is a good enough reason is that um, I needed later on in the story for him to be able to transition seamlessly into someone that we assume is capable of just going around murdering people because he's now a vampire um, and cover it up with the knowledge that he has from being inside this uh, constabulary. Um, so, I'd be yeah, tempted it... to say he doesn't need to murder his wife because I, afterwards I got, I don't know, I don't think it was set up by the murder of his wife. I got the feeling from what you said afterwards that he doesn't intend to bring anyone back alive. Ah, okay. You yeah. definitely gave me that feeling that, that he's not going out with the intention of bringing a prisoner back. I think that's a very good point. Mm. So I don't think you, you need it to establish that. It depends how much of a monster you want him to and how much you want us to hate him. I suspect mm. if you gave it to my editor, she would make you take it. Mm. Uh, and she would say there's enough violence against women in fiction we don't need that you established well, it already this is this is sort of why i was thinking about taking mm. it out uh, initially and I, I i i did sort of leave it in as a sort of uh, as possibly even like a conversation piece which i'm glad that we've t- spoken about mm. it um and uh, yeah no i think um definitely your point about that, that we know that he's not going in trying to bring people in he's not trying to arrest anybody like he doesn't call for backup when he or or do anything or do any kind of like proper process mm. for for this vampire. He he goes in with the intention of finding the lair and killing it with it with his gun. Because he likes killing things. 
because he likes killing things. Yeah, yeah. yeah and he that's... established that right at the end, right at the beginning of it. It's established. Yeah. That we, we're in no doubt. Oh well, okay, that was uh, some some fantastic feedback. Um, thank you very much, uh, both of you, and especially you, RJ. I'll uh, I'll take that on board. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Tiny Bookcase. Remember to subscribe, otherwise you're going to miss out on the future fun. Also, tell a friend. If you like this episode, link them to it. We'd be tremendously grateful. You can follow us on Twitter at Bookcase Tiny, Facebook at The Tiny Bookcase, and Instagram at Bookcase Tiny for updates. Speaking of supporting the podcast, well, magic can only take one so far. The Tiny Bookcase is supported by the generosity of its patrons. Those kind souls have really kept my belly full the last year. Let's cast a spell for them, shall we? For a Magnificent Beardery, let's cast the Chinicus Folliculale spell on Gary Laird. For rich ginger tones on the scalp, let us cast the Orangi Hedondo spell for Scott Byrne. And for general fabulousness, why not the Ula La Algemother spell on Matthew McLaren? How do you come up with that shit, man?